know that the weather is ready, but it's a very important reason to be here to show your support for this and for the shootings that we saw at the Eaton Center, unfortunately, a little over a week ago, but also the almost daily occurrence of shootings that we've seen this year in at-risk neighborhoods, and uh, it has to be dealt with. Something has to be done, and by showing your support tonight, you'll be helping uh, bring that solution a little a little closer to reality. We're going to uh, start the evening off by uh, having Kay's son come up and sing, and he describes himself as a, a little uh, urban folk with a little uh, R&B thrown in there as well. Comes to us from Ghana, now lives in Cork Town. He's a singer-songwriter. He's going to keep you entertained for the next little while, and then we'll have uh, some speakers up here to talk about the importance of why we need to end the gun violence in the city. So thank you very much for joining us today. I'm glad you guys could join us here in the rain. The reason we're here is obviously the issue is very important to us. It's important that we address the problems that occur in our communities before they get out of hand. And um, for myself, Kaysan, and uh, my friend here, Jeff Gunn, music is how we approach uh, some of these issues. And I wrote a song a couple years ago called Black Candles. And um, it's a song that I wish wasn't still relevant. But uh, music is a powerful weapon, like I said, and art can shine light in dark places. So this song is about when we lose our young people.
Gun-Free Toronto, and uh, the person behind this driving force, behind this counselor, Kristen Wallentam, who is down here, she helped organize this tonight and uh, to get you out here. So a round of applause for the counselor. We have uh, several people who will be coming up to speak and uh, to talk to you about how it is important that community get involved in this and work together on this issue. And our, our first speaker is the Reverend Dr. John Joseph Master Andrea, who is the minister of the Metropolitan United Church. He's here from Toronto, he knows the city, he grew up here, and he graduated from the University of Toronto with a BSc in chemistry, but got the call to the ministry, and it was through this pathway that the deeper urban environment opened in Toronto, the Maritimes, the Prairies, northern Ontario, and he was touched by the hands of ordination in 1989, feeling the need for further study, completing a Master's of Religious Education and Master's of Arts and Minister of Spirituality. And he's completed a doctor ministry through the Chicago Theological Seminary. Now, John Joseph is celebrating 12 years of ministry at the Metropolitan United Church, walking with people of a broad socioeconomic background. It is through that lens of the Out of the Cold program that the community of faith has given hands and feet. So, ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Dr. John Joseph Master and Dea. Shalom! Salam so wedi apa Namaste so wedi apa Peace in our time for all people in all languages Tonight we gather to remember the life of Ahmed Hassan that came to an abrupt halt the end of a smoking gun in the heart of the city of Toronto news spread faster than Facebook or Twitter. Was this Chicago, New York, Beijing, Mumbai, Rio de Janeiro? No, no, and no. It was Toronto. Many said not our city, not our Eaton Center. That is for far away places, not near at hand, in the center at the crossroads of Young and Dundas. Sure, there's violence and certain there's confrontation, but that is for the quiet places behind the scenes, not for broad daylight in the gourmet fair and the, where food is served in the front of the scenes. Something is cracked. Something is broken. What happened? Over four decades ago, remember Martin Luther King who said, now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of division and the sunlit path of justice. And now is the time to open the doors of opportunity. He said it would have been fatal for people to overlook the urgency of the moment to understand the determination of the people. He said, let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. He said, I have a dream that one day all will rise up and live out the true meaning that we hold truths to be self-evident. He had a dream that every one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain made low. Gandhi had a dream. And that the conflict between Pakistan and India 
came to a realization. Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, the Dalai Lama, all had dreams. And yet, when we look over 1,000 years ago, there wasn't a dream, it was realization. Muslim, Christian, and Jewish people lived in harmony in Spain and Turkey. What happened? Religion got in the way. Here, I'm a representative of religion, but it got in the way, and people took arms against each other. Then there were open minds, inviting hearts, not narrow minds or hardened hearts. Their dreams were something we look for, the solid reality we walk to talk. We need to look back at the recent dream makers of our time. On the team of Martin Luther King was Rosa Parks. Many may have forgotten her name, but she stood up. It's hard to imagine only five decades ago there was a segregation law in a huge portion of the United States. And she stood up and said, enough, enough, enough. Now is enough. No longer relocated to the back, but the front of the house. No longer behind the scenes, but in front of the door. Look at this lesson from the past. Recall Irish people when the Vikings invaded, they used to flee into round towers and draw up the ladder. That didn't work too well. The hope is that we don't do the same thing. That we don't flee inside behind our round towers. That we, the strategy is clearly at hand. To open our doors, open our arms, to look at each other. May we stay here at the core, touch the center of our heart with our best foot forward. Because our ways become our ways. Your thoughts become our ideas. Your invitation become our table. I have a dream. We have a way and an opportunity to build new bridges and offer open arms. The great slam poet Shane Coinsett writes, we are more. When defining Canada, we might list some statistics. We are young, we are cultures strung together, woven into tapestry and design. We are experiment going right for change with influences that range from A to Z. And yes, we say Z instead of Z. We are the colors of Chinatown and the coffee of Little Italy and the people of Little India and Little Tibet. And we dream so big that there are those who would call our ambition an industry. And someday we'll get someday will be this. Or that someday will be at the point when someday was yesterday and all our aspiration will pave the way for those on that day. We are hammers and nails ready to build bridges towards those who are willing to walk across. We are found missing puzzle pieces where millions upon millions of voices shouting. But don't let your luggage define your travels. Each life unravels differently and yet experience are what make up the colors of our tapestry. We are the true north, strong and free. And what's more is that just say it, we made it. Bob Dylan once said, don't turn your head and don't blink. Let's look forward at each other in the eye and say, Shalom, Salam, Namaste, Sowedi, Apa. Thank you. Up on stage, a man who knows about reconciliation, the Reverend Jim Ferry from the Church of the Holy Trinity. Reverend. <laughs> Good evening, friends and neighbors. You know, I've, I've heard some people say that what happened at the Eaton Center was just an isolated incident. You know, don't really worry about it. These things don't happen very much, and certainly not in our neighborhood. Well, I'd like to just question that for a moment. What exactly is an isolated incident? Well, I've had two of those within my daily life in the last month. See, I live up at Midtown near Young and Davisville. And just three weeks before the events, the tragic events at the Eaton Center, a young man was murdered in the middle of the night in the park right across from my apartment building, Oriole Park. Now we usually say, well, you know, these events happen in isolated places in the middle of the night and they really don't affect anybody. That's the nature of being isolated. But you know, it's not an isolated event because everyone has family, they have friends, they have community, 
and extended community. And together we form the larger community. And we're all affected whenever these terrible, tragic shootings take place. I can remember a month ago trying to make my way to Davisville Station and the entire park, all the neighboring streets, surrounded by police cars and yellow tape and having to find another way to get to the subway. And coming home and finding my apartment complex occupied by the police. Now that's Forest Hill, Deer Park, Chaplin Estates. You don't expect to find something like this happening in your neighborhood. And then just a few weeks later, here we are at the Eaton Center. And Holy Trinity is right next door to the Eaton Center. We were all deeply affected by what happened. I spend at least one day every week in the Eaton Center, coming or going to my place of worship, or having some food or buying something. And I was deeply affected by what happened, even though I wasn't there for the events. I can only imagine the feelings of those who worked there, those who were shopping there and witnessed those terrible events, and will never be able to forget them. Isolated events? I think not. And I think it's more, but more than just about getting guns off the street. I think that's a very important piece. But I think it's also about the community that is responsible for raising individuals who grow into the sorts of persons who think that it's okay to take up a gun to settle a dispute with someone that they know. And th those were both the situations that have affected my life in the last month. We need to think seriously as a community about the poverty levels, the lack of decent welfare, support, ODSP, poverty in communities, racism, homophobia, various forms of prejudice, and how we can motivate our politicians to build stronger communities so that people don't grow up to take guns into their hand and take the lives of other people. One has to wonder, of course, what would have happened if there were no guns available? Would that event have happened in the Eaton Center? It would have turned out very differently. So I guess my plea for your community and mine and from the Church of the Holy Trinity where I worship is that we work together, we work with our politicians to change the systems that we live in so that these events don't happen because people are formed to live lives very differently. Thank you. Church of the Holy Trinity. Joining us now on stage is Colleen Lavalie, the uh, resident of Alexandra Park, not too far from here. She's been a resident of the Atkinson Co-op for 12 years and has raised her three children in that community, and it is a community. She believes strongly in the strengths of it and the people who live in it. She's here tonight because she understands that there's a message that needs to be shared with the larger community. Colleen. Who's leaving, Reverend Masterman Dinos, but um, on a few weeks back, my family, we participated in Open Doors Toronto, and the Metropolitan Church was one of the churches that was Open Doors, and it wasn't part of our scheduled trip, but we passed through the church, and my daughter saw the logo, because children are really good at recognizing logos, we're not sure why, but they, she recognized the logo for Open Door Toronto, and she wanted to go into the church. And we thought, okay, 10, 15 minutes, we're going to look at some architecture and some art. But we got a demonstration from the Reverend Patricia Wright of the organ inside the Metropolitan United Church. And my daughter was so thrilled because she loves music, and it was the most pleasant surprise. And I think the point, and the reason I decided to thank the Reverend here tonight, is that I live over at Alexander Park, about a 20-minute walk away. and. Well, if you took a step back, you can go to Scadding Court and go fishing this week. 
and if you step forward, you move into the village on the Grange, then you move to Bay Street, then you move to Young, we get to church, we go back to Jarvis, and we go back, we're at Regent Park, we could go through the whole city, but the truth is we're all linked, we're all connected, but some of the connections are really, really, um, we, we pretend they don't exist. We pretend they're not there. We pretend that there are not marginalized communities in the downtown core. Uh, we pretend that we, uh, what was I wanting to say? <laughs> so we're, we're, we're not here. And I, I, I've accused, I, I, at Alexander Park, we've seen children who've given up and made choices that nobody wants their children to make. And, and, and we live with that reality every day and it manifests in different ways and in different ways and we, we live with fear and it's not the kind of fear that brings people to Young and Dundas Square and it's not the kind of fear that sells newspapers or time on TV or, you know, hits on a website, but it's the kind of fear that your child can be stolen from you. It's the kind of fear that tells you that the monsters that you read about in the paper, we see, we see them before they become like that. And it's the kind of fear that you're like, why aren't the schools in my neighborhood taking care of our kids' education? It's the kind of fear that says, why are the services constantly reducing in neighborhoods that need them? It's the kind of fear that says, eh. earlier in the week I, I was questioned and I, 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 I brought up the common sense revolution. 2005, I don't know if people do math, I, I, I don't understand journalists or politicians or a lot of people because 2005, if you do the math and go back, those kids were six and seven when the cuts to the education started to happen, when the cuts to social services. Do you remember that welfare was reduced at one point by 27%? And up to now, families are still living on less money than they were on 1998. This is the truth. This is the reality that some communities are living with. Also. think these neighborhoods are the neighborhoods we, we don't have to pay attention because our kids won't get hurt because those my neighborhood's gated it's got gates you cannot pull up to a house you can't go in it's a gated community there are other gated communities in this neighborhood they're designed to keep people out and these ones keep people in My neighborhood is directly below Kensington Market, directly above Queen West, a stone's throw from Bay Street, and right here on the Eaton Center. I know we have youth every year who put in applications at the Eaton Center. And I walk through the Eaton Center and I see the staff in the stores and the floor levels, and I know they don't look like the residents of my city. I know one store in particular in the Eaton Center, and we won't name it, but they offered to pay some reality stars not to wear their clothing, so we know what they think of us. Our children really need opportunities. They need to believe. They lose hope right around eight or nine. They need to believe that there's opportunities for them. They need to believe there's a future for them. And they need to believe that the footprints that we walk on, and I think I demonstrated earlier, it's the same footprint, the Reverend, I didn't know the Reverend was speaking here today, didn't know the connection existed. We're walking on the same street, we're walking in the same spots. And I don't know if people notice, I, 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 I read everything, everyone's concerns about the Eaton Center and everything, and I went down there to eat before I came on here so I wouldn't fall down. 
and um, I saw the women that were cleaning the uh, food court. I asked one of them how long, late she's working tonight. She's working till 11.30. She's my age. My son's 18. Who's watching her son while everyone comes here? And everyone wants to say it's not their responsibility, but she's serving you. She's serving her community. She's paying her bills. She's feeding her children, and she's right there right now. I saw her today. I didn't ask. I just saw her. I know she looks like me. I know she looks my age. And so we, we, we write these stories, and we tell people to be afraid. It's not the gunshots we're afraid of. And I want to keep saying that because maybe we've gotten used to them, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that. But the fact of the matter is, we, we lost them before they picked up a gun, and and everyone watched, and nobody said anything. And uh, let me see if I wanted to say anything else. I think that's it. in her community as a member of the Region Park Community Crisis Response Network. Sandra? As you just heard, I have five children. My 24-year-old son grew up in the same neighborhood as Ahmed Hassan and Christopher Husbands. My heart goes out to those boys and their families. My 13-year-old daughter loves nothing more than to come to the Eaton Center and to go shopping with her friends and to sit in the food court. My heart goes out to that young 13-year-old and his family who was released today, thank God. My 16-year-old son attends a downtown high school and he sits in class and he plays on sports teams with young people from all over our city. These are our children and they need our help. You know, it's not enough to talk about stopping violence. As mothers, we know that you just can't tell kids to stop doing something. It never works. There's a saying that's really well known, and I'm sorry if it sounds cliche, but it says, peace is not just the absence of war. Peace is the absence of the need for war. Well, we don't have a war going on in our country, in our city, but let's translate that into our situation. Peace is not just about the absence of violence, friends. Peace is about the absence of the need for violence. And all of us can say, well, there's never a need for violence. There's never a call for violence. But what is it that's making our young people, our children, solve their problems with guns and violence? It's not enough to just tell them to stop and find better ways we need to help our children. So what does that look like? What would the absence of the need for violence look like in tangibles? It means our kids need an opportunity to be able to play sports on real teams. It means our children need opportunities to sing to dance, to participate in arts programs. It means our children need opportunities for real jobs and real careers. The Bible says, don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. And that's not just a platitude. We've seen what evil looks like. Evil looks like lost lives, it looks like broken lives, but 
but what does good look like? It's not enough to just say solve this problem. All of us gathered here, particularly, I put my call out to mothers. Mothers, we need to think and ask ourselves, what can we do about it? What can I do about this situation for our children? Our counselors are here and they are listening. Don't just stand there and say do something. Go to them with suggestions, with ideas, with programs. Go to them with concrete tangibles and say we need this in our neighborhood. They are listening and they want to help. Open your homes. As my friend just said, where are your young people? Don't point a finger that they're out on some street corner if your doors aren't open to receive your young people, if they're not eating in your home in a safe place, if they don't have adults surrounding them with conversations. As a mom, I know that sometimes things get, things get too dark and too scary for our young people to want to burden us moms with them. And I can't tell you the role that youth workers have played in the lives of my children. I can't thank enough the workers from the Kiwanis Boys and Girls Club, from the Parks and Recs uh, community centers, from the churches. They have made such a difference in the lives of our children. We need to go to our counselors and say we need more youth workers. We need to know that there are people there when our kids can't come to us no matter how much we love them. We can't afford to keep good as some platitude, as some intangible, when evil is so real and so destructive. We need to be concrete in what good looks like. And if we walk away from this, if we walk away from saying, what can I do to make this look different? The cost will be too high. The cost has already been too high. Just a long time. Uh, talk to them as well. I see uh, our provincial minister is here, Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, Glenn Murray, also the Toronto Centre MPP. So those are the people you want to talk to to bring, bring about change. Uh, tonight and into the future, so please go talk to them. Even tonight, go talk to them. They'll be more than willing to listen if they're here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I was afraid. I was afraid I was going to say that. I was going to miss a couple. I was going to say some counselors were here, and I'll leave it at that. How's that? My apologies, everybody. There are several counselors here. Please go talk to them about that. Uh, and we'll we'll move on now. And joining us on the stage is uh, Kimberly Bell. And she grew up in Alexandra Park, has been working in Scadding Court, the community center, since she was 14, starting off as camp counselor. Then she graduated from Central Tech, completed a community service worker program at Trios College, and has now become a mentor for other youth, not just in the center, but the whole community. Kimberly Bell, everybody. Yay! Woo! And a youth of Toronto, and who's lost my brother as well to gun violence. I'm very concerned about the guns and the gun violence in our community. My condolences go out to the family who's lost their loved ones and to the families that as well lost their loved ones. My prayers and thoughts go out to them. But today what I want to say is like, as a member that lives in the community, I want to say a few things that are not cool. One thing that's not cool is the fact that you wake up, you come outside and you see your area taped off and you have no idea what happened the night before. And then to be found out that your friend has been shot in the middle of the night or someone that's close to home is hurt, injured. And then another thing is you go to work or you're going to just a corner store and you're being stopped by police officers and asked questions that you know nothing about. And you feel scared and you feel unsafe and you don't know who to turn to, who to talk to, if you should talk to anybody or if you should just keep to yourself because the best thing to do is keep to yourself and you'll be safe, but keeping to yourself is not safe at all. So. What my message today is that this evening I would like to put forth a message of interest and peace to stop the gun violence. And for the youth in our community and our community center, that guns are not cool and it kills. And there are lots of opportunities and ways to solve problems without violence. And so think before you pick up the gun. And tell friends, a guardian, and tell your youth worker, because there are a lot of youth workers that are in our community. 
And all of these are avenues to peaceful resolutions to conflict. So please today, as I speak, just think before you act and it might save a life. Because we're tired of losing loved ones in our community to gun violence. Thank you. Elaine Lumley, and she is with the Coalition for Gun Control. And as important, she's also a mother. Elaine? I'm actually a mother who lost a son to gun violence. Something I don't wish on anyone. My name is Elaine Lumley, and on November 27, 2005, my only son, Aidan Lumley, was shot and killed. He was shot with a handgun, and probably it was stolen from either a gun collector or smuggled across the U.S. border. He was raised in Toronto, went to high school at Oakwood Collegiate. He was a top swimmer, top athlete. He won OFSA. He was a third year university student at Trent University. He had just qualified for the Ontario swim team. And Aiden was my only child. His murder has not been solved. Not one witness has come forward. No justice has been won. Aiden was a charismatic young man. He loved life and he had dreams and aspirations and he wanted to live. The death of Aiden has been absolutely devastating for me and my family and for all of Aiden's friends. And in one instant, Aiden's death changed my life. I no longer had dreams or aspirations for my son. I was thrust into a world of guns and murder Aiden and I had never seen a gun. Over the years, I have, I have spoken out publicly about the need to keep the long gun registry, improve our social situations for our very poor citizens, a need for witnesses to come forward with vital information. It has been an upward battle trying to speak with politicians. It has, it has been an upward battle trying to get answers for all our murdered children because there are so many of us in the Toronto area that the murders are unsolved. But here I stand representing my son Aiden and I'll not give up. Yes. We should not wait until something drastic happens. We all have to do our part to ensure a safe community. Every murder is an outrage. And our club is getting bigger. More families across Canada and Toronto are suffering from gun violence. A gun does not discriminate. A bullet does not care if you're black or white, if you're poor, if you're rich, if you're young, or if you're old. A gun, whether it is a long gun, a shotgun, a handgun, it will kill you dead. There are many groups here in Toronto trying to help victims and families. United Mothers Opposing Violence Everywhere is one of them. There are many people that are a part of my little club. Odette Shepard's son, Justin, was killed 11 years ago. A promising young athlete who had just won a scholarship to the States. He was shot down in Rosedale. Murder unsolved. The shooting at the Eaton Center should be a wake-up call for all of us. We have to send a message to our leaders. We want a safe place, a non-violent place to live. Those of us who know the agony of losing a child want to make it harder, not easier, for dangerous people to get access to guns. We need to stem the illegal flow of guns. Gun control is part of the solution. Unfortunately, politics appears to have taken priority over, over public safety. Now that we have lost the gun registry, gun lobby groups want to relax the controls over handguns. We cannot let this happen. Our federal government must stop the weakening of gun control. 
Our Premier Dalton McGuinty needs to speak up and take a stand against gun violence. We are all vulnerable to gun violence. We need to work together. We need to stand together, speak up for our safety. It is too late for my son Aiden and Justin and Kareem and Lee and Jane and Sultan and these are just a few of the young people that have fallen in the last couple years. But it is not too late for your families. The guns are here. They're here. They've been here for a while. Wake up, people. The gun violence has touched all of our lives. It is time to stand together. It's time to say enough is enough. It is, it is time to send the message loud and clear. We need a gun-free city. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Kofi Hope. He is the Managing Director of Community Empowering Enterprises. Kofi. For the last few days, last few weeks, I've had a very heavy feeling of deja vu. This feeling that I've heard this story before, that I've seen this before, that we've all been here before. And that's because we have been. And for far too long, our city has been traumatized by gun violence that's been wrecking communities. But my feeling of deja vu, there's little more to it than that of simply remembering this story. On June 2nd, I was just down the street at Ryerson, and I was involved with a uh, conference for a group called Lost Lyrics that brings together young people from Jane and Finch and Malvern and other communities and uses hip-hop and the arts as a tool for empowerment. And it was deja vu for me because I remembered that six years ago in 2006, when I was leading a group called the Black Youth Coalition Against Violence, Myself and my peers were gathered in that exact same school, Ryerson, night after night, planning another conference around mobilizing people around the issue of gun violence. And actually that same group, Lost Lyrics, was there with these dynamic, empowered young people who through the arts and hip-hop and poetry were rising above the situations that were trying to pull them down in their communities. But it was also six years ago, just down the road from here, on Boxing Day, that there was another public shooting, that there was another outcry, and that the day after, I was gathered with other youth leaders in front of City Hall for an event exactly like this. So here I am, six years later, and it seems like so little has changed. It seems like it's the same story all over again. But why? Why are we here again? And I know that there's groups like Lost Lyrics, which I mentioned, and the youth workers that came up that are doing amazing things in the community. And that fills an argument I've always had. And that's that while the media may put black youth on the front page as hoodlums or criminals or thugs or at the heart of the problem, I really believe it's 99% of black youth and young people in general that are actually saying no to the lifestyle of guns and gangs. And they are actually not the problem, but the solution to it. And it's these tremendous young leaders who are out there every day making a difference right on the front lines who are doing a great amount of good for this city and the body count would be much higher without them. That being said, my dear friends, there's more going on here than just gun violence. There's more going on here than the need for more youth programs. And there's more than simply one shooting that took place on June 2nd. Because these shootings are the symptoms of something greater that's going on in our city. The gun violence that's happening where young people feel a sense of hopelessness and desperation and are so con disconnected from Canadian society that the only way they can feel empowered by being part of a world of gangs, guns, and drug sales and violence. That issue has to do with something that's been going on for a long time in our beautiful city. And that's how slowly we are becoming a city divided. A city divided between a wonderful middle-class world of gleaming towers and a vibrant downtown, and a city of tower blocks filled more and more by the working poor and visible minorities who feel more and more disconnected from the rest of the city. 
Now, study after study has talked about what's happening and how incomes are becoming more divided. And with youth unemployment as high as it is, with racism and discrimination still alive today, and our school system failing so many young people, gun violence, unfortunately, is the natural result. And yet, it's not simply an issue about black youth or youth. There are so many groups in this city that are not being supported, whether those are seniors, whether those are new immigrants, or whether they are young children or young families struggling to pay the bills. And so for me, if we want to get past this sense of deja vu, if we want to not have to come to another rally like this, if we want to never open up the paper again and see on the front page another young person being killed, we must step past the sensationalization of the violence and what's going on, and we must focus on the real struggles faced day by day by the working poor in this city. The stories that never make the front page, the stories that don't get the documentaries or the other coverage. You know, and for me, and the rain's getting a little crazy, isn't it? Um, when I see what's happening in the city and the debate, I realize how disconnected we are from the young people and their realities out there. When I hear we're in a city where we're seriously debating building a giant Ferris wheel to revitalize the waterfront, it just makes no sense to me. Because where is the plan to revitalize Jane and Finch? Where is the plan to revitalize Malvern? Where are the plans to revitalize Rexdale? But somehow that's not part of our discourse. At the same time, I see, and this is with every issue, whether it's climate change, whether it's to do with transport, these are issues which will take decades to fix, and yet we're always looking for the short-term solution. It's always, we just need tougher sentences and more police on the streets, and that will be the end of gun violence. And while I can understand that sending SWAT teams every few years into our most marginalized communities to round up every young person they can, while that may make a short-term solution, if the fundamental issues in those communities aren't changed, then five, six, seven years later, the next generation of young people are going to come up and step into the same shoes that were left by those other uh, gang members or gun-toting young people who were sent to prison. And some people may say, when you talk about this or talk about pardons, how we're now trying to make it even harder to get a pardon in Canada, when I, working at Jane and Finch, see young people every day who feel they have no options left in life, because they have a criminal record and not even law laws will look at their resume so they're doing side jobs and odd jobs and being pushed into the underground economy and now we want to make uh, the system for getting a pardon up to 10 years I realize that we're truly disconnected to what's causing these issues and how to stop them and yes someone may say that means that I'm being soft on crime or that I'm talking like a socialist or a bike riding pinko or whatever it is but to me it's not about being soft on crime. It's a question about being smart on crime or being stupid about crime. And being stupid about crime, being stupid about crime means that we embrace solutions that may make us feel good. So we're gonna lock up a young person for as much of their adult life as we can. But it's being stupid on crime because we've now guaranteed that when that young person gets out, they're going right back into that same lifestyle. And we've now created a career criminal who we're going to have to house in prisons with our taxpayers' dollars for years and years into the future. And beyond that, as I've said, the real issue we need to come together to solve is the fact that our city is becoming more and more polarized between rich and poor. And the only way to solve this issue of gun violence is to handle these issues head on. And again, when we think about that, these young people didn't come from Mars. They were raised in Toronto in our society. They're a product of our own society and we need to take ownership about them. I believe we're at a crossroads in Toronto. This city is the best city in the world. I truly believe that. I've tra had the luxury to travel almost across the globe and when my wife and I had to choose uh, about eight months ago where we wanted to live, we said there is no doubt but coming back here. But we are at a crossroads. Either we can work towards an equal and inclusive city, or we can become like cities like Paris, where we have a gleaming, wonderful downtown, and the edges of our cities are full of young, alienated, 
and angry young people. That's not the type of Toronto I want to live in. That's not the society I want to live in. And the only way we can stop that from happening is begin to start to talk about the real issues and come together as young and old, Muslim and Christian, politicians and citizens, united around building a city where all are included. Thank you very much. God bless. From Oxford, where he's on the verge of getting his uh, doctorate in politics. So I'm sure we'll see him on the political scene in the next little while bringing about change. Uh, we have one more speaker. Uh, thank you for putting up with the rain. It looks like it's about done. So we've, we've tolerated it. And it's Marlon Moraro. He brings 20 years of experience supporting and building healthy, safe neighborhoods for the diverse population of Toronto. He's particularly passionate about the role of young people in building and maintaining vibrant communities. And he believes systems need to grow and change to meet the needs of youth and the growing barriers that exist. I would like to start off by saying, I don't mind the rain. I don't mind the rain for a number of reasons. I'm alive to experience the rain. It's a beautiful thing. Condolences goes out to all the parents, the mothers, fathers, siblings, who have lost a loved one. Not because they chose to lose a loved one, but because they are part of a community or communities that are undernourished by not having resources. Youth workers who are stressed because they are tasked with taking care of our children, our young people, community service agencies that are doing their utmost work to take care of our children and our young people. This is what parents are living with. The bombardment of we are not important. You don't vote. You can't vote. And because you don't vote, or you can't vote because you are not given the right to vote, you are unable to participate in the political system to make your community that much better. These are the conditions of our families. These are the conditions of our community service agencies. So I don't mind the rain. Let it rain. It's okay. Because the message is, young people are dying. Agencies are doing their best. Politicians and our elected officials are adding to the help. Where are we going wrong? Is it, like my friend said, deja vu, another year? Another newspaper title that says, Year of the Gun again. No, I don't think so. It's not the Year of the Gun again. A different message. Toronto, do you want to be in another country to see their citizens read the newspaper that says, Toronto, year of the gun. Is that the standard? It's not the standard. 20 years of working, Alexandra Park, Regent Park, Rexdale, Jamestown, Mont Olive, you name it. Those are communities that we have created as a system. People are placed there because of their resources. We don't have poor children. We don't have poor young people. We have poor families that are not given the opportunity, the resources to help like everybody else is trying to do, make their community that much better. So I do bring a sad message. We should be doing a little bit more. We should be supporting the young people who are supporting the young people. There are the leaders. How do we cut youth programs? How do we cut daycare services? How do we increase food banks? How do we have another shooting? 
I can tell you, working in the Rexdale community right now, there have been a number of shootings, a number of dead bodies, and a number of deaths. Is it the Eaton Center? No. But it's Jamestown. It's Mount Olive. It's those people. Those people are our people. Let's not gauge our success by looking at our financial district and how much income we have generated. Let's gauge our success by how we distribute the wealth of our communities, of our businesses, so that everybody has a good chance of making it. So that I don't have to stand in the rain with a sad message. So I could stand in the rain and dance with the Samba Squad, just like many other people would like to do. Those young people did not grow up one day and say, hey, guess what? I'm going to pick up a gun. Because I guarantee you right now, there have probably been a dozen youth workers a dozen or more agencies working to deal with those issues. But if we don't give those agencies and those youth workers the power, the authority, the resources to help us work with those that are most vulnerable, then we will suffer the consequences. Keeper, you're damn right I am. So every young person that crosses my path is my child, is your child. And at the end of the day, let me give you a quick, simple reminder. As I get more gray hair on my face, I know one thing, that these young people who I dismiss are gonna be the same young people who will take care of me when I get old and, yo, let me tell you something. I need the fund. And I think that should be your investment fund by supporting initiatives that support making all of our communities better. So whether it's a shooting at the Eaton Center or a shooting in Jamestown, it makes no difference. It's violence, it's not right, and we will not be gauged as a city by the amount of violence that is perpetrated in the city. So I'm leaving you guys with a challenge today. Listen to all the speakers, go home, share it with your families, with your children, and think about what can I contribute to my investment fund of supporting communities? And I thank you for standing in the rain, and I hope that you understand the message. Say a prayer, say something kind to all the people, the mothers and the families that have lost somebody. Their pain is our pain. Thank you very much. We end the evening with the Samba Kids, because it's a reason for hope. And this is what we're fighting for right here behind us. Hopefully they don't start up though until I'm standing in front looking back at them, though I'll be deaf for sure. But they're put on, the Stanford Kids are backed by the Drum Arts Canada. It's a charitable organization that's dedicated for, to providing accessible arts education, which is disappearing all too rapidly in the country as well. It's a sad fact. To children and youth in Toronto's priority neighborhoods, Samba Kids performing troupe is made up of children and youth who have progressed through the DAC program and are ready to entertain the Samba Kids perform at events and festivals year-round, singing, dancing, and delivering crowd-pleasing, hip-shaking, except in my case, world music. So please enjoy it. Thank you for coming out tonight. And think about what, is, what has been said tonight and, and go out tomorrow and try and make a difference. Thank you for joining us.